Your Bibles turn to the book of Acts this morning. I know that surprised you. Acts chapter 13. This morning we're going to be picking up and looking this morning at verses 14 through 32. I have found that the name church on a sign or over a door of a building doesn't guarantee that the gospel of Jesus Christ is necessarily being declared or being preached from within those doors. There are a lot of buildings that have church, that have synagogue, that have temple, that have different uh, names that are given to them, worship center. And yet on the inside, they're empty, they're void of the gospel message of Jesus Christ. You see, the name Assembly of God, Baptist, Methodist, it doesn't guarantee the declaration of the gospel. Sadly, even those that would put independent, fundamental, full gospel, Pentecostal, Holy Spirit-filled church doesn't guarantee that on the inside you're going to hear the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Most churches in existence today will tell you that they claim to declare the gospel, but the tr- truth this morning is, is that many churches are far away from the gospel. This morning in our passage, Paul is going to give his first sermon. It's the first sermon that Paul is going to preach. And in this sermon, he is going to give us a, a little bit of a, a brief history lesson of who God is. And the fact that God is in everything. We have to understand this this morning, church, that God is in everything. And in this brief sermon that Paul is going to give, he declares that God has been, God was, and that God is and always will be in everything. And then he ends up by declaring this message. He declares three elements of the gospel. Number one, that the death of Jesus Christ took place. Secondly, that the burial of Jesus Christ took place. And thirdly, the resurrection of Jesus Christ took place. You see, that is the three elements of the gospel message. And if there are churches around that are not preaching the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then they are not preaching the truth that changes hearts and changes lives. You see, it is these three elements, it is these three that are important Whenever a sermon, whenever a message goes forth, because it is only found in Jesus Christ, salvation for mankind. At the end of his sermon, we'll see in just a minute, he says this, he says, We declare unto you glad tidings, we declare unto you, the the King James says, good news. We are telling you the good news. So Paul gives this, this message about who God was, why God is central to everything, and he says in the end, it is all good news. It's good news. The message of hope, the message of Jesus Christ, the message of who God is, is good news for those who believe. It's good news for those who trust in the Lord. It's good news for those who call upon the name of the Lord. The bad news is for those that don't recognize, first of all, who God is, and second of all, that Jesus Christ is the only way to the Father. We see we live in a world where we've kind of put aside the importance of knowing God, first of all, and then understanding how we can have a relationship with him once again. The statement that Paul used here of we bring you good tidings, we're bringing you good news can be found also in Luke chapter 2. The the angels came to the shepherds and, and they said, fear not for we bring to you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people. You see, the message of hope, the message of Jesus Christ, the message of the good news isn't for just a chosen couple people. It is for all people. We bring good tidings of great joy that shall be unto all people. So the good news is for everybody. The problem is that so many few choose to believe the good news. The greatest news your ears will ever hear, the greatest news that you can ever come across is the message that Jesus Christ came to save sinners that jesus christ came to save sinners he came to save a wretch like me he came to set me free because i am a sinner (laughs) i'm a sinner i've done things that are wrong i've messed up i i still make mistakes and i am so thankful that god is faithful to forgive that god sent his son to forgive 
who I am. Too many churches have gotten away from the gospel and they, they've turned to this idea of religion. Religious works, religious things happening here. You know, you have to be religious in this, you have to be religious in that. And, and we've gotten so full of religious rituals, religious efforts, religious programs that we fail to recognize that it's about a relationship with Jesus, not about religion. We've forgotten that Jesus himself said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. You see, no matter what we do, no matter what the ministry is, no matter what program we're doing, if it's not lifting up Jesus, then it's missing its mark. If it's not lifting Jesus up and pointing people to Jesus, then it's missing the mark of spreading the good news, missing the mark of spreading the gospel. Today's a, a special day for Suzanne and I. It's a special day for our church. Today actually celebrates 10 years that Suzanne and I and our family have been here at New Life. It's hard to believe that... It's hard to believe that 10 years ago when I came, I had a whole lot more hair, a whole lot less white. It's hard to believe that when we came here, our kids were just coming into the youth group. Carly and, and Michael graduated and, and went on. And it's hard to believe that 10 years ago, when we first drove into Altoona, Pennsylvania to, to meet with the church board, that God would allow for us to be able to share the gospel message, the good news, for 10 years. And friends, believe me, it's not over yet. <laughs> because God still has a work to do. God still has a message of hope that needs to get out to this community, to the surrounding area. God still wants to use us, to use this church, to spread the gospel with our missionaries around the world. Why is new life healthy? Why is new life still going? Why has new life survived? I, 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 it's like 27 years that new life has been in existence. Why? Because from the very beginning, with, with Pastor Tim Hoster, from, Paul Foster, from the very beginning, the good news, Jesus Christ has been preached. That Jesus is the only way to the Father. From the very beginning, Jesus has been preached. The message of hope has been brought forth, and it continues to take place to this day. You see, when that message stops... In this building, this building, this church will also cease to exist because it's no longer a church because the church is made up of those who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is those who have a mission and a heart to say, yes, we want the good news to go out and to be spread. You see, God is blessed over the years. There's been ups, there's been downs. There's no question that God has blessed in all of it. And I believe that reason is because we put such an emphasis and a focus on declaring the truth about who Jesus Christ is. Jesus is the only way. The only way. So having said that, let's dig in. Acts chapter 13, beginning with verse number 14. Acts chapter 13, beginning with verse number 14. <clears throat> it says, On the Sabbath they entered the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law of the prophets, the leaders of the synagogue sent word to them, saying, Brothers, if you have a word of exhortation for the people, please speak. Verse 16, standing up, Paul motioned with his hands and said, Fellow Israelites and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. The God of the people of Israel chose your ancestors. He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt. With mighty power, he led them out of that country. For about 40 years, he endured their conduct in the wilderness. And he overthrew seven nations in Canaan, giving their land to his people as their inheritance. All this took place about 450 years. After this, God gave them judges until the time of Samuel the prophet. Then the, king, then the people asked for a king, and he gave them Saul, son of Kish of the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled 40 years. After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Verse 23, from this man's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Savior Jesus as he promised. Before the coming of Jesus, John preached repentance and baptism to all the people of Israel. As John was completing his work, he said, who do you suppose that I am? I am not the one you are looking for, but there is one coming after me whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. Fellow children of Abraham. And you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. The people of Jerusalem and the rulers did not recognize Jesus. 
Yet in condemning him, they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. Verse 29. When they carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the cross. They laid him in the tomb. But God, friends, always remember, but God, no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're going through, remember that, but God, but God raised him from the dead. And for many days, he was seen by those who had traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to our people. And finally, verse 32, we tell you the good news. We tell you the good news. The first recorded sermon from the Apostle Paul. In this sermon, we find that he points out the history of Israel leading up to the coming of Jesus Christ. He points out the, the, the opportunity for men and women to have this great salvation that is offered through Jesus Christ. This great salvation for sinners that would only be accomplished through the one that died, was buried, and rose again. We also find in this sermon that the fact that the story behind Jesus is not just Jesus' story. The story behind Jesus isn't just that, that he was born of a virgin, that, that he lived a spotless life, that he died and rose again, and, and he went away to heaven at some point. The story of Jesus is all wrapped up in who God is. Because the Bible tells us that in the beginning was the Word. Who was the Word? Jesus was the Word. That Jesus has been there from the beginning. And everything is wrapped up who Jesus is and knowing who God is. And knowing that God is in and God is through everything. When you look at this passage we read this morning, you can see that, that, that it's saturated, that it's full of references to who God is and what God has done. Sixteen times Paul points out that God is the central actor, that God is the central theme in Israel's history. That it was God that put into place what happened through Israel. This morning I want to just briefly run through this passage so that we can see that it is always God that's at work. You see, in your life right now, you may be going through some times, you may be going through a challenge, you may be going through a great time of victory, but I want you to understand as we go through this and we point out these 16 points, that in your life, God is active. God is at work. That God doesn't just step aside and say, well, you're on your own now. But God is at work in this world today. God is at work in your life, and God is at work in my life. God is at work in the church. God is at work in this world. Sometimes it's hard to see, sometimes it's hard to believe, but know this, that all throughout history, God is at work. Back to verse number 17. In verse number 17, the first part of the verse tells us that it is God who chose Israel. Look at it. The God of the people of Israel chose you. It is God who chose Israel. Israel didn't just rise from, from the ashes and become this great nation. It says, no, God chose Israel. God chose Israel from the people of the earth. Why? Because God had a plan for Israel. God chose them for a special purpose. In the middle of verse 17, we see that it says, God is the one who made the people great during their stay in Egypt. While they were in captivity, while they were enslaved by the Egyptians, God allowed for them to prosper. God allowed for them to become great. They became so great that they began to outnumber the Egyptians. God blessed, God multiplied. God brought the increase to them while they were in Egypt. God made them grow and prosper. The last part of verse 17 says it was God who led them out of Egypt with his mighty power and his uplifted arm. It wasn't that the Israelites, while they were in captivity, all of a sudden had this epiphany. Hey, we're bigger than them. We're better than them. Let's get out of here. <laughs> they could have done that, but it never even occurred to them. God stepped in and said, I will be the one that leads you out of captivity. I will be the one that shows my mighty power. I will be the one that, that steps in and, and releases you from this oppression. God is the one that brought them out of the land of Egypt. God put on an unusual display of his power. Ten different plagues brought upon the Egyptians. It wasn't Moses that brought the plagues. It wasn't the Israelites that brought the plagues. It was God himself. You see, God steps in in his own way. In his own power. And God delivered them from Israel. Look at verse 18. It's God that put up with all of the Israelites' nonsense in the wilderness. <laughs> wow. How does that relate to us today? 
God putting up with our nonsense as we go through this journey of life. I know there are times in my life when I do some crazy, stupid, weird, dumb things, and I can just hear God saying, Wayne, why? <laughs> why? Why did you do that? Ah. And what do we do? Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Over and over and over, when you read about the children of Israel, you read about how they messed up, how they blew it, how they broke the heart of God, how they turned to their own wicked ways. And yet time and time again, God says, I put up with their nonsense. I put up with their wayward ways. I put up with their, with their rebellion. And I was faithful. I never left them. They left me. You see, God will never leave you. God will never forsake you. God is always there in your life. Even in the times when you wonder if he's there, God is always there. The problem is, is that we come away, we drift away from him because we give ourselves over to our own desires, to our own fleshly urges. And the Bible says when we do that, it breaks the heart of God. And God says, it breaks my heart, but I'm not going to let go. I'm going to still hold on. God is willing to put up with your nonsense. But friends, let me tell you, you need to knock off the nonsense pretty quick because the Bible says he's coming soon. <laughs> he's coming soon and he's coming for a church that has been changed, that is spotless, that is white, and that is ready. We don't know the time or the hour, so man, you might as well get ready now because it could be before the sermon is over today. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> it would cut my sermon, sermon short and we'd have you out of here. Hallelujah. <laughs> Jesus could come at any moment. And yet he says here, I put up with the Egyptians' nonsense. Basically, God is saying, like he did in Deuteronomy 131, I've endured, I bore with the Israelites. I carried them. I carried them. And the times when they were making mistakes, I picked them up and I carried them through to get them to the point where they would recognize that they needed me again, where they would recognize that I would be the one that sustained them. Verse 19 tells us that it was God who destroyed the seven nations of the land of Canaan. The people went to war with the sword. Yes, the Israelites rose up with the sword, but it was God, the Bible says. It was God who destroyed them. Paul is stressing the, the omnipresent hand of God in all of human triumphs. Sometimes we look at our life and we have these victories. We have these triumphal moments that, that we experience, that we, we encounter. And Paul is saying, listen, it's not because of you. It's because of God." Yes, Israel went to war, but the only reason they won the war is because God stepped in and God won the battle for them. Proverbs 21, 13 says, The horse is made ready for the day of battle, but the victory belongs to the Lord. You see, church, we do our part to prepare for battle, but it is God that brings the victory. We do our part to prepare for battle. We pray, we fast, we seek the Lord, we prepare ourselves because the Bible says that there is a war going on. We study this Wednesday night in Bible study that there is a war that's raging in the heavenlies. So we prepare ourselves, but it is God who brings about the victory. And time and time again, when Israel went into battle, when they trusted in the Lord, when they prepared their hearts, when they prepared their life the right way, God brought the victory. The sad thing is, is that when Israel would go into battle and they didn't give it to the Lord, there was always defeat. They'd always be conquered. Why? Because the focus was on themselves rather than God. Verse number 20. It says God is the one who gave them judges. These rulers didn't just rise up from among them because of who they were related to or because of the course of human events. They didn't have an election to determine, okay, who is going to be our next judge? They weren't appointed by some council. They weren't appointed by Moses, who would have been the acting president at the time. These judges were appointed and raised up by God himself. It was God who gave them judges. Verse 21, we see that it was God who gave to Israel her first king, King Saul. In the very next verse, we also see that it was God who removed Saul. God put him in place and God removed him. It's amazing how that can happen sometimes in our life. God can open up doors. God can prepare things. God can put us through. But if we're not following him, if we're not serving him, if we're not obeying, God can remove us from those positions. God can remove us from those places. Daniel 2.21 says God changes times and season. He, he deposes kings and he raises up others. Daniel 4.32, he said the most high is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth. And he gives them to anyone God wishes. God removed Saul just as quickly as he gave the Israelites Saul. You see, the Israelites were complaining. Why can't we have a king like everybody else? 
How many times do we hear ourselves saying that? God, why can't I have this? They've got it. Why can't we do this? They're doing it. I mean, how many times you that have kids, you, you always hear a kid, Mom and Dad, can I? No. Why not? Because it's not good for you. But so-and-so's doing it. So-and-so has it. That's what Israel was doing here. They were complaining. Give us a king. We want a king. Everybody else has a king. <laughs> well, they got a king. God gave them the king Saul, and Saul messed things up pretty bad. <laughs> the Bible says that God removed him. So what's God do? In verse 22, it tells us that God raised up David, the son of Jesse. God chose this young boy that nobody would have ever thought of choosing. God chose a nobody who was good with a slingshot, who liked to play the harp, and who liked to write songs. That's who David was. He could play the harp, he could write some songs, and he was pretty accurate with that slingshot. Nobody would have picked David. Nobody would have even looked. When, 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 when the prophet came and, and he came to choose from Jesse's family, from Jesse's sons, the Bible says he had Jesse's sons line up before him, and one by one he went through the sons and saying, oh, surely this must be the next king of Israel. Man, he's, he's rugged, he, he, he's strong. This must be the one. He's handsome. This must be the one. He, he's good with finances. This must be the one. And time and time again, God said, nope, nope, not that one, not that one, not that one. To the point where it came down to this, <laughs> Jesse, come on, is there any other boys? And the father himself was reluctant. Well, I got this one son, he's out in the field, he's with the sheep. The brothers didn't even think to call him. The dad didn't think to call him. But praise the Lord, God is the one that called him. You see, when people look at, uh, at you, when people look at our lives, they may look and go, eh, God can't use them. They don't have this, they don't have that. But friends, when God looks at you, he says, I will use you. I can use you, no matter what anybody else thinks. You see, it was God who called. It was God who said, I am going to choose David out of all of these young men. God took Saul down and he put David up. It was God's doing. Verse 23, Paul shifts his attention to some more recent events. He tells them that it was God who brought Israel a savior. And that savior was Jesus Christ. The verse says at the end, God did it as he promised. God did as he promised. I promised Israel, that a Savior would come from the line of David, from the lineage of David, a Savior would come. And he says, I brought that son. You see, it wasn't just a random thing that God said. It wasn't a random act that God brought about. It wasn't something to just say, well, I, I better get on this. God had a plan from the beginning. God wasn't just active in the moment that Jesus entered the world. God had a plan long, long ago. God had a plan that out of Israel would come the Savior of the world. And he spoke it long ago. He spoke it, why? Because when it happened, we would know that God was bringing it to be. That God was bringing the prophetic message into reality. In verses 24 through 25, Paul quotes John the Baptist, saying that he took the attention off himself and he put it on Christ. He put it, he put it on God's anointed Savior. People said, John, who are you? John, are you the promised one? John said, oh, no, 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 no. I, I'm just a messenger. I'm just a prophet. Because there's one that's coming after me whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. John knew from the very beginning that he would preach a repentance, but that the repentance would only come through salvation in Jesus Christ. I'm not the one. It's the one you need to look forward to. It is Christ, the anointed Savior. He's coming. He's coming. Be ready for him. Jesus says, of himself that no prophet born of, or of John, that no prophet born of woman was greater than John. And yet John says, I'm not worthy to even untie the sandals of Jesus. Why? Because John wants everyone to know that Jesus is the center of the story, not anybody else. Jesus is the center of the story. No other prophet, no other man, no other woman, not you nor me, no other pastor, no other priest, no other rabbi. There is nobody else that's the center but Jesus. Look at verse, six, verse 26. Paul says, to us, this message of salvation has been sent. In other words, he's declaring, it was God who sent us this message. 
From the very beginning, God had a plan, and God sent us this message. God planned it. God accomplished it in Jesus Christ. And God is sending this message to you, and God is sending it around the world. Why do we, why do we support missions? Because we want this message to be sent so that all can hear. Verse 27, Paul goes out of his way to show that even those who didn't know God, those that didn't serve God, those that want to have nothing to do with this God of Israel, they were themselves even used to fulfill the prophetic word. It's amazing how God can use people that have no idea they're being used by him. <laughs> Sometimes we like to look and think, man, they're being used by the devil. Ugh. They're being used by the devil. But sometimes God can use those people in their wicked ways to bring about the reality of what we need to understand that God is doing in our hearts and in our lives. These men that were out of step with God, they couldn't understand what God was up to, yet God still had a plan because of his prophecy. It says here they did just what the prophets said they would do, but they had no idea they were following to the letter of the script of the prophets. Why would Paul point this out? See, if a person reads and understands God's prophecies and fulfills them, you can conclude that, well, they partnered with God. You understand God's prophecies, you understand his word, and you say, yeah, I want to be a part of that. You can say, man, yeah, I, I was part of that. I, me and God, we planned that out. We, we were working together. But when God uses those that didn't even know about it, we can understand that God is the center of it. It's not you and I that make the plans, but it is God. Paul is on a clear mission to make it known that all of history is God's story. All of history is God's story. To put it in a way that I've heard before, history is his story. History is his story. All of history is points to who God was. All of history points to who God is today. All of history points to who God will be tomorrow. And ultimately, it points to who Jesus Christ is and that he is the way, the truth, and the life. It is God who is getting the work done. And I'm crazy enough to think that it is God that is working in our lives today. In verse 29, Paul makes that same point. He says, after they had done everything the prophets said they would do, they took him down from the cross and they buried him. Friends, the arrest, the trial, and the death of Jesus wasn't merely the work of man. It wasn't the work of men that had it out for this person that was proclaiming a new gospel. You see, it was God's plan from the very beginning. Paul repeats the same words expressed by Peter in his, in his first sermon. In Acts 2.23, he says, they, this Jesus, they delivered up according to the definite plan and the foreknowledge of God. See, God knew. God had a plan that he would send his son, that his son would die, that his son would be buried, and his son would be raised again. Finally, verse 16, or it, the 16th one here that Paul points out is in verse 30. tells us that it was God who raised Jesus from the dead. This would be a, a great Easter sermon, but this is the sermon of our life every day. <laughs> It was God who raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus didn't just miraculously gasp and have this breath of fresh air come into his lungs and say, Woo, I made it, I survived, I tricked everybody. It wasn't that doctors rushed into the tomb and said, Okay, we've got this new medicine we're going to try out. We're going to see if we can bring somebody back to life. It wasn't that Jesus was just sleeping. He was swooning inside there and, 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 and one day he would wake up. No, the Bible says that it was God who raised Jesus back to life. It was God who brought him back to life. You see, there is no hope in a dead Savior. <laughs> there is no hope in someone that says, oh, hey, you know what, I I I'm here for you, and then just dies and goes away. Jesus said, no, I'm going to die, but on the third day I'll rise again. Wait and see. God breathed life back into Jesus, and he rose again from that tomb. This Jesus was delivered up. He was brought back to life. Paul's point is that God has been at work from the beginning and was at work in the death and resurrection. And friends, let me tell you, God is at work in sending the message of salvation into all the world today. 
This book of Acts is all about sending that message, spreading the gospel, taking the good news of Jesus into the world. So why? Why does Paul go back and why does he recount the history? We can just read over it and we can say, oh, that was neat. But you see, history is a documentation of what happened. And Paul is laying out that in everything, God. Think about it. When you tell somebody a story of something that happened to you, when you tell a story, does it go something like this? Well, when I was five years old, I recognized that God had told me to do this. And, and because I did it, God stepped in. And, and, and as a result, God got rid of that bully in my kindergarten class. And, and as a result, I, I understand that, that it was God that talked to my teacher. And my teacher was the one that, that called my parents. And, and as a result, it was God that was able to, to bring a, 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 an end to the bullying when I was in kindergarten class. We, we don't talk like that. And yet... How true to reality is it that that's probably exactly how it went? That God was involved in it. That God was involved in everything in our life. We may not recognize it, but God is involved. God is involved in our story, just as he was involved in the story of who Jesus Christ was. Paul didn't have to do this, and yet he did, because he wanted people to recognize that God always is working. Paul was very intentional in how he chose to narrate this story. He was declaring a powerful truth, one that we need to listen to in our lives today. The message was very simple. This is the, the synopsis of what Paul was saying. There is a great and glorious God. Know him. Reconcile yourself to him and be consumed with thoughts about him. Paul is telling this church, or he's telling the, these people, those that would believe and those that didn't, he said there is a great and there is a glorious God. He has been and he does exist today. You need to know him. You need to know this God. Reconcile yourself to him. In other words, yeah, turn yourself over to him. Get, get into that relationship with him. Be consumed with thoughts about him. So many times in our life today, we are consumed with thoughts of this world. We are consumed with the thoughts of what can I get? What can I have? How can I do this? How can I do that? And we are not consumed with the thoughts about who God is. The one that created you. The one that fastened you. We're consumed with thoughts about how can I have this or how can I have that? Paul's pointing out that it was God at work in all of Israel's history. That God is the history maker. Not you and I. God is the explanation for the meaning of everything in our life. We've come into a time in our society where very few people believe that God is, let alone that God is the center of everything. Most people today are trying to remove God from, from any and everything. They're trying to remove God from, 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 from schools. They're trying to remove God from the workplace. They're trying to remove God from, from even politics. They're trying to remove God, sadly, they're even trying to remove God from churches. Why? Because is God really necessary? Do we need all of that? No, this is what they'll say. Do we need all that religious stuff? Do we need that religion pushed down our throats? Friends, if you're pushing religion down somebody's throat, you need to stop right now. Because religion will save nobody. Only a relationship with Jesus Christ will. We need to preach the message of hope, which is Jesus Christ, who died, was buried, and rose again. And yet the world says, we don't need it, we don't want it. But yet in everything, we have to recognize that there is a great God. We need to make sure that God is in everything in our lives. The world's consumed with debating and arguing over events that, that never focus on why is it happening in the sense that where is God in it? You see, the world never wants to connect anything to God. The world never wants to connect anything to His plan and His purposes. When you think about it, all of our communication, our media, and our education, they're really superficial because they don't deal with the most important aspects of the subject, which is God. You see, without God, there is nothing. Without God, there's nothing. In the beginning, God. That's it. It all started with him. The Bible says, in him we live and move and have our being. And it's all going to end with him. 
In the end, he will send his son to redeem the church, to bring us into eternity with him. And he'll reestablish a new heaven and a new earth. All our communication, our media is superficial. Think about it. We blame guns because it's easier than discussing the real heart issue that there's a void in a person's life because they don't have Jesus. We don't deal with the real problem. We deal with what's easy to blame rather than saying they need Jesus. They need a change in their heart. They need a, a change in their life. We blame because it's easier than discussing the need for God. We blame the government because it's easier than dealing with the fact that this world we live in is temporary. <laughs> it's temporary. The Bible says heaven and earth will pass away, but he will endure forever. This is all going to go someday. It's all going to pass away. But we're so focused on we got to deal with this, we got to deal with that, we got to take care of this, we got to take care of that, that we fail to recognize where's God in all of it. What's God doing? We blame, blame, and never allow God to be a part of the equation. Our news reporting is superficial. Our history books are superficial. Our education system becomes superficial. Why? Because the incredible, unimaginable disregard for God is nowhere to be found. Church, when we eliminate God, we eliminate the only constant in the universe. We're eliminating the only explanation behind everything. When you eliminate God, you're eliminating all understanding of truth. When you take God out of the equation, you're limiting all understanding of what truth is. I can get up, I can, I can share an inspiring uh, message, uh, uh, an inspiring talk. A lot of people are they're, they're taking and they're saying, well, you know, that, that, that talk was great. But without Jesus, without God at the center, it's just meaningless words. Oh, yeah, there's, there's things that can help us. There are things that can encourage us. There, there, are, there are things that can, can get, get us on the right track. But, friends, without God, it's all meaningless. Solomon said, meaningless, meaningless. <laughs> it's all meaningless. It's vanity. Vanity of vanities. Without God, we have no meaning. When the main thing is missing, when God is missing, everything else just becomes superficial. If you and I if we as a church become as superficial as the world, answer me this, who will share the gospel message? If we become so superficial that we're just trying to attain the things of the world that we fail to recognize that God is the center and Jesus is the one who can set free, then how are we any different? Paul declares these 16 truths that it is God who is in control of everything. And then in verses 28 through 30, he tells us that it all points to the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Can I tell you this morning? The message of the gospel is not debatable. The message of who Jesus is is not debatable. I don't care what anybody else says. God said it. This is what happened. This is the truth. It's not debatable. Oh, the world will try and debate us. They'll, they'll try and get us into this long discussion, this long debate, trying to trip us up. But friends, it's not debatable. It's the truth. And we must stand on the truth of who God is, on what he did, and how he brought his son into this world to set us free. The message of the gospel is not debatable. It's absolute truth. Why? Because, first of all, it's based on his story of who God is. Who God is in eternity who God is today, and who God was. Yet the world, and even sadly many churches, will debate about how, what, when a person gets saved. They get into these discussions about how does a person get saved, or, or when does a person get saved, or what does it take for somebody to get saved. The Bible tells us that a person is born again. They are saved. They, they are brought into a newness of life when they obey the Word of God. When you obey the Word of God... You're saved. Well, how do you obey the word? What obedience do we have to have? It says this, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It's that simple. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Well, who is Jesus? Jesus is the one that died, that was buried, and rose again. You believe on that, you'll be saved. It's that simple. 
And yet so many people try and make it hard. They try and make it difficult. God said, this is what you have to do. It's not what Pastor Wayne says. It's not what some theologian has to say. It's not what anybody else has to think. It's what God says. God says in the Bible that when a person acknowledges their sins before God, God, I am a sinner. Lord, I've sinned. I have messed up. I have really blown it. (laughs) When we acknowledge our sin before God, when we confess and we repent and say, Lord, I am sorry, forgive me of my sins. And then we call on the name of Jesus. Jesus, I recognize that you're the one that died for me. I recognize you're the one that went into that tomb. You paid the price for me, but I recognize you rose again so that I might have life just like you had newness of life. You see, when it all comes back to that, it comes back to the truth of the matter. That God is the center, and he had a plan of salvation from the very beginning. And yet there are those who reject or even despise the gospel message. They debate and they get filled with rhetoric in the world and they change the facts of what the Bible says. But the bottom line is this, is that every man, woman, boy, girl, young, old, no matter where we live in this world, everybody needs to be saved. Everybody. The Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. That means all of us need a Savior. And there is only one Savior, Jesus Christ. There's only one Savior, and his name is Jesus. Because of this truth, those of us who know it, like Paul, must declare it. We know the truth. We know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So why do we just sit back and not do anything and share it? The Bible says we need to share it. 1 Corinthians 15. It says, moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to scripture. Once again, we see the reference that Jesus Christ The history of God tells the hope that we have in Jesus about his death, about his shedding of his blood, about his burial, and about his resurrection on the third day. This was God's plan of salvation, and he demanded it to be done. It wasn't man's choice. It was God's choice. Jesus himself in Mark 16, 15 told his disciples to go into all the world and preach this gospel message. Friends, we need to declare it today. There's no debating it. We need to declare it. And we need to also never dilute it. You see, the message of the gospel must be declared and never diluted. Never dilute it. Don't take things away. Don't add things to it. This message in and of itself is enough. Religion has diluted the gospel by mixing man's efforts with Jesus. Jesus plus this. Jesus plus that. Friends, let me tell you, it's not Jesus plus you. It's not Jesus plus anybody else. It's not Jesus plus this and Jesus plus that. It's Jesus and him alone. Acts 4.12 says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It's not Jesus plus works. It's not Jesus plus I got to do this, I got to do that. And that, that, sadly, that's the way a lot of people think in the world. Well, I got to clean up everything. I got to make myself right. And then Jesus will accept me. No, the Bible says that Jesus will accept you just as you are. He will take you in your sinful state and he will say, yes, I hear your cry. I hear your shout. I hear your desperation to have your sins forgiven. And I am the one that can do it. Come to me. Confess your sin and I'll forgive you of your sin. Jesus is there waiting for that. In Acts 15, 1, it says a certain man came down from Judea and he taught brethren, unless you be circumcised according to the customs of Moses, you can't be saved. Verse 11 says, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they are. You see, man was even at the very beginning trying to add on to what was accomplished through Jesus. (laughs) The religious leaders are saying, okay, we'll accept the Gentiles in, but you got to circumcise them first. Jesus says, no, no, no. Or Paul says, no, that's not the way it works. By the grace of God, they've already had the circumcision of the heart. And they're accepted by God. It's not Jesus plus water. 
I'm so excited for those that are going to be baptized next Sunday night. It's exciting. But friends, you're not getting baptized to be saved. You don't need to be baptized in order to get to heaven. It's not Jesus plus water that gives you to heaven. It's just Jesus. Believing on him, calling on him. Baptism is just saying, I have believed on Jesus. And I choose to follow after him now. It's not even, for us this morning, it's not even Jesus and extra words that you don't even know what you're saying. You don't have to speak in tongues to be saved. The Bible nowhere says that. Man, I am grateful for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I am grateful for the initial physical evidence of speaking in tongues when we're filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and I think it's incredible. I think we should all desire that. We should all go after that when we know him. But you don't get tongues in order to be saved. It's just a, a language, a prayer language that God gives us so that we can communicate, that we can praise and we can worship him, that we can know that we're filled with his power. You only get it when Jesus is in your life. It's not Jesus in a whole bunch of extra words not Jesus and this, Jesus and that. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. Paul would call all those another gospel. Listen to what it says in Galatians 1.9. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, in other words, other than Jesus Christ, let them be under God's curse. Friends, salvation isn't some easy believism. Believing the gospel must include repenting as well. Believing the gospel must include repentance toward God. You see, repentance brings a total reversal of our life, our thoughts, our deeds, and our desires. I believe, I believe, I believe. But if we're not willing to say, Lord, forgive me and I repent of my ways, have we really truly believed? Have we really truly surrendered? See, we declare that the way I was doing things was selfish. It was all about me, and now I'm letting God have control. And I'm turning from my ways, and I'm going after his ways. Last scripture here this morning, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Hallelujah. Man, there's some rotten, old, miserable things in my life. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. The old is gone. And behold, through Jesus Christ, his work, all things have become new. You see, the God of this world, the God that created everything, the God that holds the, the world in the palm of his hands is the same God that reaches down and says, I love you. And because I love you, I've given you hope. I've given you salvation through Jesus Christ. The God of this world is still living and active. We sang several songs this morning about the greatness of our God. The Ashley song, How Great Is Our God. Do you believe it this morning? Do you understand it? Do you recognize that God is great and that he is in control? If not, you need to, first of all, have that understanding of who God is to recognize that he brought his son into this world to bring you hope, to set you free, and to give you life. Would you stand with me this morning? Who is God in your life? Just a story, just something that somebody says. Who's God in your life? Is he just a curse word that slips out when you mess up? This past week, Suzanne and I celebrating 10 years of being here, but my family celebrated my parents' 50th wedding anniversary on Friday. 50 years for my parents. They're not here, but you can clap for them. Congratulations to mom and dad. And my sister Wendy put up a Facebook page and we invited anybody we knew that knew them and they got on and they left memories of things that took place, messages to them just to, to encourage them. And all those memories that were shared were points of history in my parents' life. And in all of them, they had to do with their work in the church what God used them for. 
know, sometimes in our life we can think, is it worth it? Is, am I doing it? Is it? Am I going the right direction? And yet sometimes if you just take a moment to look back, you can see God's hand. You can see God working. You can see God touching. You can see God moving. I told my parents, I said, incredible, 50 years of marriage. More incredible is 49 years your kids didn't kill each other. <laughs> you know what it's like with siblings. And yet, in it all, there was that foundation that my parents, that they laid. That in everything, God. What about in your life this morning? In everything, do you see God? In everything, do you recognize that God is working? even in the times when you may not understand it. The disciples, when Jesus was being beaten, when he was put on the cross, the disciples were going, how is this possible? I don't understand. How is this God's plan? And yet three days later, he rose again. The children of Israel brought out of Egypt. Yes, this is exciting. What do you mean we got to wander for 40 years? How is this God's plan? Yet in the end, they went into that promised land. In everything God. In everything God. Can you just think of a God moment in your life? Think of a time when you really know that, man, God was there. Maybe this morning, it's that day you gave your heart to him. and said, I surrender and I give you my life, Lord. Maybe it was something that led up to that point where somebody met you where you're at. They stepped in and they said, hey, come to church with me. What's that God moment? See, in everything, God. In everything, God. Would you just bow your heads for a moment? Lord, we're thankful for this message that Paul delivered a message that pointed out who you were in history and how it all brought up to the time of Jesus. So that they would see that you had this in plan. You had this plan from the beginning. That Jesus would come. That Jesus would lay down his life. Friend, this morning as you're pondering these thoughts, let me just tell you that the only, the only hope for eternal life for you is in Jesus. Jesus shed his blood on Calvary. He was buried and he rose again on the third day. Friend, Jesus is alive. We have a living Savior. We serve a risen Savior. Do you know Jesus today? Have you made him a reality in your life today? See, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, don't wait another day. Choose today to receive him. Choose today to let him come into your life. Maybe you're here and you know Jesus as your Savior. You're, you're a Christian. Let me ask you this question. Are you declaring the gospel message, the good news, like Paul did to others? Are you involved in taking the gospel around the world? Oh, you may never travel to the corners of the world, but your world is Altoona, Hollidaysburg, Tyrone. Are you involved in taking the good news? Can we join together this morning and say, Lord, we want to seek you. We want to serve you. We want to live for you. Maybe you're that person this morning that says, I've never given my life to him. I've never recognized how God was working in my life. And today I want to ask Jesus to come into my life to forgive me of my sins. Maybe this morning you say, I, I want to be active. I want to spread that message of hope and spread the message of love that God has sent his son. 
that's you this morning as the, the worship team leads us, I'm just going to encourage us just to, to step out. If that's you, you need Jesus to come into your life. You want to accept him as your savior today. You want to ask him to forgive you of your sins. You want to believe on him. Just wherever you're at, I, I encourage you to step out from where you're at. Somebody's in your way, just, just say, excuse me, and, and come down to the front. I want to pray with you. I want to, I want to just pray that prayer that Jesus would come into your life today. Maybe this morning you need to step out and say, Lord, I haven't done a good job of representing you. I've taken for granted this hope that I have. Today, maybe you just need to step out and say, Lord, I'm, I'm going to let my voice be heard. I'm going to let my life be lived for your glory and for your honor. That's how we're just going to simply close this morning. Just say, Lord, we want to honor you. Just like Paul. If you need Jesus this morning, I'm going I'm to ask you to come and come up to my left. You're right. Just come and stand here. And, and I want to pray with you this morning that you would just allow Christ to come into your life. If you're, you're coming for another reason, maybe kneel or just stand over here. If you need prayer for something else, someone will meet you here and pray with you this morning. Because we have a God that is able. We have a God that is faithful this morning. Worship team, lead us. If you want to come and ask him into your heart today. Just come and meet me right here. I want to pray with you this morning that he would come into your life and do that. Maybe you can say, hey, go with me to the front. Somebody will come with you. We can do this together. Hallelujah.